We want to welcome our friends at Fresh Start Mall Campus. Let's do that right now, shall we? In a moment, I'm going to introduce this gentleman to my right, and I'm so excited that he is here. But um, we have, uh, years ago, a person that's here worshiping with us on Saturday night at Pine City was here at, the, at our campus and talked, well, we only had one worship service back then, but he talked about Cuba and the way God was moving in Cuba. God is still moving in Cuba, and we're excited about that. And through that connection and through my friends from Caton United Methodist Church, Chad and Jessica Sayers, uh, this has all happened. And it's so neat to realize the way God is working in our lives. Uh, I just met Willie Santiago on Tuesday of this week. And it's uh, so such an honor to have him here. What he's going to share ties in so much with what we're doing as we're becoming uh, one church, multiple locations, and about to move to Watkins Glen. He's going to share more about that and his own personal testimony. And so I'm going to just turn it over to you, Willie. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I need to tell you something before to start. Um, my English is very broken, as you already realize, you know. You know? Um, I wanted to um, just ask you uh, one favor, so I can continue now. Yeah. Do you remember in 1950 this American show named I Love Lucy? How many remember here? Do you remember this guy, uh, this year next, named Ricky Ricardo? He was from Havana, Cuba, so you are used to some Cuban accent already, so you need to forgive me any accent. If not, remember the show, you know, how um, probably you will hear me to say, explain, can you explain me, you know, like he um, did it at that time. Again, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here tonight. We really are so blessed and honored to just share um, a little bit about what God is doing in the nation of Cuba. And some people say, Cuba, New York, I say, no, South Florida, you know, 90 miles from Key West, the nation of Cuba. So this is where we was born. And we wanted to share with you today about what God is doing in one of the last uh, communist uh, nations in the world, which is uh, um, Cuba. And let me start with this. In 1938, in a small church in Alabama, the church over there gathered and they prayed over a very young girl, American girl named Miss Leora Shank. This American girl, in her 22 years old, she decided to give her heart to Jesus and go to the mission field and preach the gospel. She renounced to the American dream. She, she said no to live here in the United States, and she went to the nation of Cuba to talk to Jesus to the Cuban in 1938. 1939, the Methodist Church sent her to a town in Cuba in the province of Matanzas named Santa Rosa. And Miss Leora Shank started to talk to Jesus to all the farmers over there. In Cuba, farmers are very tough and they was very deep in, into the witchcraft. So when they saw this girl, you know, that Come, came from so far, they started to listen to her, and the result was almost a whole community come to Christ. One day, Miss Leora was talking with a Cuban girl, girl named Margarita. Margarita was in her 25, 26 years old. She already had three children, you know, and then 
the next Sunday, Margarita show up in, a, in, this, uh, in the small Methodist chapel in Santa Rosa, and she gave her heart to Jesus. Guess what? Margarita, the Cuban girl, was my grandmother. Somebody in 1939 from Alabama decide to go to Cuba to talk to Jesus, to the Cuban people, and here is my grandmother receiving Jesus in her heart. And you know what? This act of my grandmother accept Jesus changed the destiny of my family. Today, my son is a pastor, my cousin is a pastor, my sister is a pastor, a pastor, and we do ministry in Cuba because somebody in 1939 told my grandmother that the only way to go to God is through Jesus Christ. And then the destiny of my family was changed forever. And I know you as a church also wanted to do a start another campus. And you wanted to go on other places and start to talk to Jesus. And this is what we are supposed to do. You know what? Before in England, they called the Methodists, Methodists, they called us the enthusiastic movement. You know, before they called the Methodists, Methodists, they called us enthusiastic people. People that was, you know, full of life and full of passion for Jesus. And this is what this girl in Alabama went to Cuba with enthusiastic heart, sharing the gospel with my grandmother and many others. And guess what? In 1959, uh, we had a communist revolution in Cuba till today. And in 1959, all the missionaries, included, including Miss Leora Shang, they need to leave Cuba. And she, this American missionary, she never knew about us. She never knew about the new generations of believers in my family and in another families. And sometimes in ministry, it's like that way. You go to one place and you sow the seed. And sometimes we wanted to see the results very fast. And no, let's give in God's time. You know, just plant the seed wherever you go. The seed of Jesus, the love of God in the heart of the people, and let God to grow this seed inside of the heart, you know? So 1959, we have a communist revolution till today. And guess what? The good thing about it is, is this. From 1959 till today, you have 11 presidents. We have one. Guess what? We save a bunch of money in elections, you know? So um, this, is a, this is the good thing about it, so just to laugh a little bit. So, in, you know, as soon as the revolution took a power, was a conf confrontation between the church and the government, and many people in the nation of Cuba, many pastors, many church leaders, they left Cuba or they left the church. And the church was almost uh, dying in the nation of Cuba. I remember when I was a little boy that somebody told me, so, uh, I was walking in front of the church that my grandmother gave her heart to Jesus, you know, and somebody told me, hey, little boy, come here. You see this church here? Someday, this church will become a Marxist a study center. You know that, you know, this word Marxist a study center, you know, that we will kill the, your ideology. We will, uh, all your Christians will disappear because our ideology is more strong than yours. And I grew up in this environment. I grew up as a Christian boy, and I wanted to tell all the families here today in this church that you have Christian uh, children. Don't even think always that your children necessarily are Christians because you are. I grew up as a in a Christian home, but I was just a kid, a boy that believed in God, but was not real Christian. Sometimes we think that we you know because we grow our children, they are Christian. And guess what? To be born in church is not a guarantee that you are a Christian. To be born in a garage doesn't mean you are a car. And that's happened. You know, I grew up 
in a Christian family, but my heart really was not uh, close to the Lord. In 1973, I started I start to the school um, I, I, as a, a little boy. I was six years old, and I wanted to go to the school because even when I was not very, uh, you know, as a boy, I had in my heart the, the, the feeling, the, the, the desire to become a doctor, to become a missionary like David Livingstone in Africa. I wanted to be a missionary to preach the gospel to the people, but I wanted to be a doctor to healing people and to help them. So here I, I was in 1972, 73, in this little school in, the, in Santa Rosa, you know, where all my family was raised. Um, this morning, I remember very well, we were about 25 students in the classroom. Again, I was six years old. And suddenly, the teacher called me to the front. I mentioned my name and said, Willie Santiago, come here to the front. He called me to the front. I remember he was a tall guy. You know, he put me in his side. He looked at me and he said, Willie, you are such a stupid boy. You are an idiot. You are enemy of the state. I was six years old. He started to tell, tell me these things. You are part of the local Methodist church. You are enemy. I was six years old. And for the first time in my life, I understood what bullying, discrimination means. And so many times you hear in America, you talk about bullying in the schools. And bullying is terrible. But the worst bullying is when coming from the teachers. And this is how that happened with this little boy of six years old, I was. He, this guy killed my dreams. This guy made my childhood miserable and then the others that come. So we grew up in a very hostile environment. When people who believed that they was part of the government or other institution, they just did bullying against us. I was terrible, was terrible. Little by little, you know, uh, they, they saw in my heart that I was a loser, that I cannot make it. But you know what? We in the churches, all the, 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 the few people that remain in the churches in the 1970s, they start to pray about revival in the nation of Cuba. In 1985, something happened. Uh, suddenly, Many, many, many thousands of young people start to come into the churches. I don't know why. The Holy Spirit, you know, start to bring young boys and young girls into the churches. You don't need to preach them. They just came. They start to put uh, Hispanic music into the service. They start to praise Jesus. They was on fire and they was very enthusiastic about God and about the Holy Spirit. And then these young people, they covered the streets of Cuba. They covered almost every town, every village with home churches. In Cuba, we are not allowed to have beautiful facilities that, like this, but we are allowed to uh, gather and have home churches. We, we are allowed to gather in the backyard of the people. We don't have uh, cars, but we do have garage. You know what I mean? So we put the church in the garage. Sometimes they tell us, you are, um, you are allowed 12 people in the church, and sometimes 100, 150. So it's a revolution right now in Cuba, but it's a spiritual revolution making through the Word of God. We are right now, you know, we have a tremendous church planter movement in the nation of Cuba. And I remember... In 1990, in 1991, when we started planting about 26 churches around our church, the way that we started to do was this. When we came to a town and we wanted to open a church, we also opened a church, not an institution. You know what I mean? The first thing that one, the people want to hear is not the name of your organization. The first thing that the people wanted to hear is the name of Jesus. And this is what we present to the people when we, we uh, went to a house and we talk and we share about Jesus. 
not an institution or denomination. You know, we present the Word of God. And this is the way how people who are thirsty of God, people that used to be drunk, people that used not to be believers, they come to Christ right now. And this is how the church in Cuba, the church planter movement in Cuba is growing right now like never before. How the Holy Spirit is go, uh, going around the, the nation of Cuba. You know, centuries ago, John Wesley well, was in Aldous Gate, and he felt his heart get warm. And guess what? The Holy Spirit touched him. And we cannot plant a church without the Holy Spirit, because if we plant a church without the Holy Spirit, will be a club, will be not a church, you know. And, you know, and John Wesley said centuries ago, I am not afraid the movement, movement named Methodist die. I'm afraid that the movement named Methodist became a cold religion. And we have to be enthusiastic about, uh, you know, present Jesus to the people. Present Jesus to the, to the community. When I was 17 years old, I'm almost finished. You know, when I was 17 years old, I made the most important decision in my life. I wanted to become Christian. I want to accept Jesus as my, sa as my Savior. And I did it. And I remember how God put in us this energy. Before I was blaming the church for the discrimination that happened to me. Before I was blaming the Lord for the bullying that they did to me in the school. But now, after we received the Holy Spirit, after we received like we call Altus Gay experience, you know what? Everything changed. I can't wait to tell people, hey, I'm a Christian. Jesus love you. You know, enthusiastic, love to, to the, to the, to, and love for the people. And this is what the Holy Spirit uh, is doing. Many of my friends in America asking me, Willie, I will pray for you that the government in Cuba change. I say, no, don't do that. Don't do this. This is not about government, guys. Many of my friends, you know, here, they have a tremendous a trust in government, you know, this is not about this. In Cuba, everywhere, we can change government hundreds of times. But guess what? The condition of the people remain the same. So pray that the Lord protect us and equip us and we can continue ahead, spreading the gospel in the nation of Cuba and whatever the Lord sent us. So we are over there. We have a tremendous revival. I almost finished because I know the rules here in the UMC. If I talk too much, you will never invite me again. So, you know, so I wanted to, you know, that you pray for us in this way, that the Lord equip us, help us to continue ahead. And we are here today to extend to your pastor, to all the all of you, and a special invitation to go to Cuba. We are here to ask for your heart, ask for your presence, you know, and go to Cuba and, exchange, and share with us, church with our churches, with our people over there. You know, now it's, uh, very, it's, it's very safe and it's very possible to go. So I wanted to let you with these words, you know, wherever you will go, Whatever you wanted to start a church, whatever you uh, uh, are uh, talking about God, do with passion. You know, do with passion. You know, and probably you say, yeah, you are Latino and you are Caribbean guy. You, you, no, no, it's about everybody. It's about everybody. I remember Anglo-Saxon people in the 17th century in England, there was called enthusiastic movement. You know? So let's rejoice in God. Let's have fun in Jesus, you know. Let's not be boring. Jesus is not boring. And this is how we live our life in Cuba, which is very exciting to live in Cuba. Sometimes too exciting. But that's fine, you know. We are trying just to spread the word of God um, in the nation of Cuba. And we ask you to be there and help us. Thank you very much. I wish to talk more, but again, this is a nice congregation, a beautiful place. I wanted to come back. So, yes, and now,
let me share with you something. We have, um, we have a ministry farm. We have about nine acres that we help people in the community, that we bring uh, fruit to the local uh, uh, institutions, you know, churches and other people. But we have about 35,000 pineapple plantation. You know, and the, we wanted to show you something about what God showed us through uh, farming. Can you believe it? And we wanted to show a little video. If it is okay, Pastor? Yes, okay. And then explain to you something. Right here, we are in a pineapple field. You know, this is about 35 pineapple uh, field. This is a ministry, a 100% ministry things. And we wanted to explain you something. Remember, I'm from Cuba. Um, you know, most of the time, Ricky Ricardo was say explain because he was from Havana, Cuba. And this is what we do. So let me explain to you this. This is a pineapple right here. When pineapple takes about one year and a half, when we plant it, they take about one year and a half. Then later, the pineapple start to produce. This is the first time that this pineapple produce. But look at this. Around the pineapple, she, they already have some, we call children's, that this is exactly what we using to re, um, replant a new uh, pineapple field. But look this one here. This one here, you know, coming with this same pineapple here. The first year, the pineapple, they will produce one pineapple and several children that you can replant. But the one, when we cut this off, a new pineapple will come here. And about three or four new, let's say, children like this will coming up. The pineapple die, and then the new uh, children coming up. I was explaining the pastor that this is a principle in God's kingdom. When we are a mature Christian, when we are people that are giving everything for God, we need to be sure when we go, um, we cross the gate, to let around us, or in our churches, people who can follow what the Lord uh, said us to do. So this is about discipleship. The real, di the real leader is not this leader that keeps the power just for himself. It's the one that prepares the others when he's not... Uh, here in this earth, the other will continue God's work. And this is what we find in the pineapple plantation. It's a principle in discipleship. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. As an expression of appreciation, Willie, I went to Cuba today and brought this back. And it only cost $2.49 or something like that. We're so blessed to have Willie here. I wanted to mention that our special offering this weekend at all of our campuses, if you choose to give beyond the regular giving, uh, will go to the Cuban Connection and the furtherance of the wonderful work that Willie and Joel and folks like that, uh, that they're doing. Um, we had a little conversation this week about the possibility of folks from our church going to Cuba sometime. Anybody think that might be a fun thing to do? Uh, we have, oh, I saw a couple of hands go really high there. Um, we're, of course, going to continue our trips to Honduras, but they're generally in springtime, May-ish, right around Memorial Day. We're wondering about maybe something in the fall, I, I, offering people that opportunity uh, to go under the leadership of, uh, of Willie and Joel and maybe even Pastor Chad from Caton. So we just have to see how that develops, but we're excited. And I love what he said, what Willie said about enthusiasm. You know, and those early Methodists were, that was a put down, those enthusiasts. Well, we are enthusiastic for Jesus Christ. That's the secret, isn't it, to sharing. When we have something to share is when we have that enthusiasm. And you know what the word enthusiasm means? It means in God. And theos means to be in God is to be enthusiastic. So I had to just come back to you and uh, kind of hold our, our feet to the fire and what's happening in our church life this fall. Um, serving God's purpose. The memory verse, we've called it memory verse. I think I'm experimenting with a new way to refer to the verse each week. I'm calling it a life application verse, which I hope you will memorize. But I want you to more than memorize this, apply it to your life. Would you read that 
With me, it's Acts 13, 36. Let's read it together. Now, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep, he was buried with his ancestors, and his body decayed. When I think about David, and David is one of the most famous people in the Bible. He lived about a thousand years before Jesus. He wrote most of the Psalms in the Bible. Paul is talking about him in Acts 13 when he makes that statement about, about David. And I, David served God's purpose. So he was intentional. That his life was intentionally focused on serving God. Our discipleship we teach has to be three things. It has to be intentional, relational, reproducible, much like the pineapple with their children. Uh, the pineapple is intentional, uh, if you will, about spinning off some children pineapple. And, and it's not just about that pineapple, but it's about the future. We're called to be intentional with our purpose, to serve God's purpose when? In our generation. Now, we, in the course, in the context of our church, might represent a few different generations. You know, uh, there's the old folks like me, and then there's the people a generation ahead of me, or maybe even a couple generations. There's still a few 95-year-olds or so around. And then there's the younger folks, and then there's the millennials, and then there's the children and faith builders right now. So we get to serve God's purpose in a little bit of a generational wingspan, if you will. A little bit older than us, a little bit younger than us, but that's basically what we're about. David found that to be true. He could serve God's purpose in his generation. So we're talking about discovering our purpose. Uh, we're talking about relational in our generation. So we intentional, relational, the people around us, the people like us, the people that we relate to, and then reproducible is the third aspect of genuine real life discipleship is that what we do ought to be reproducible in others. And that's why we have more than one campus. God has blessed us at the Pine City campus and so then we've allowed that to spin off to uh, the Saturday night service and to the, uh, the Sunday morning service at the mall. And just guess what? In two weeks, another campus at Watkins Glen we're taking that enthusiasm, we're taking what God is doing, what we believe to be the way the Lord made us, and we're producing not just our pineapple, but we're producing pineapple children, if you will. And so that's what we're called to do. I think about Willie's story and about his, his grandmother, uh, what was her name? Margarita. And how Margarita was touched by this lady from Alabama, 22-year-old. Imagine leaving Alabama in 1938, going to Cuba, and affecting Margarita. As Willie said, uh, the lady from Alabama never knew the impact that had. We don't know the impact on the generations to come. We only see a limited distance. But God has a purpose for you and me to influence our generation so that the world will be changed. David did that 3,000 years ago. We're still changed. Every time we read the Bible and we read those Psalms, we're affected by David fulfilling God's purpose. So this fall, we are being intentional one more time as we move in two weeks to Watkins Glen. Uh, we want to take the healthy aspect of our church to another location. And every indication is that God's favor and blessing is upon us. We don't want to take that for granted. We continue to depend and ask you to pray with us. Now next weekend, the Fresh Start Mall campus, you guys are celebrating your fourth birthday. You believe it's been four years? Let's say happy birthday to them. Happy birthday. I am, I am hoping somehow to get there for part of that celebration. I hear there's food, you know, so of course I got to be there. But we're so excited about what's happening at your fourth birthday. Uh, I've talked to Peter Wood, and we're going to have some special, fresh testimonies of people whose lives have been touched by that ministry at Fresh Start Mall Campus. And we're, we're just so excited, looking forward to that. Did I mention that in two weeks we're starting at Watkins Glen? I guess maybe I already mentioned that. Would you please look at your back of your Let's Connect card? There's a couple boxes on there that I really want to lift up to you as opportunities for your per your support and participation with our Watkins Glen launch. Um, 
we invite you on these remaining two Fridays, uh, next Friday's the 23rd, the following Friday's 30th, to fast. We're calling them Fasting Fridays. Now, however you choose to fast, it could be from one meal or two. I talked to someone that fasted all three meals this, this last Friday. Um, I fasted a meal. I also was inspired by Lydia to fast from some media. I, am, I did a lot of driving this last week, and I am a real talk show radio-aholic. Is that a word? And I decided as a fast on Friday, I didn't listen to the radio. You know how hard that was? But you know what that made me do? It made me listen for God's voice instead. So fasting is whatever it takes to clear away the distractions, whether it's food or radio or TV or whatever, so you can listen for God's still, small voice. So I invite you to check that box that you will join us in fasting these next two Fridays before we launch in Watkins. I invite you to participate with us on uh, next Sunday, uh, the 25th, a prayer walk in Watkins. We're going to meet at 2 p.m. at the house there in Watkins on 4th Street, and we'll have some suggested routes for you to take. We're going to walk around Watkins for a couple hours and pray around the area and invite people. We'll have some uh, brochures to hand out at the same time. And then the very day before we launch, Saturday, October 1st, from 1 to 4 in the afternoon, we have reserved Lafayette Park, and we're going to have a lot of fun things there. We're going to have music playing and activities for children and adults. We're going to do some uh, adult trivia game kind of thing. And there's a very special ice cream. Oh, also chili. We need you to make chili. How many of you can make a pot of chili for that event? Let me see those, those, I want to see those hands at the mall. I'm looking for you there. We're going to have a friendly competition with our campuses. Who brings the, the best chili? We're going to have chili and hot dogs, popcorn, ice, did I mention ice cream? And we're just excited about all that. One more thing. If you feel inclined on October 2nd or one of those Sundays in October, to leave your regular campus and come visit Watkins one time just to support us, I give you permission to do that. In fact, I encourage you to do that. We want those first Sundays to, to re really feel like there's, that we talked about enthusiasm, right? We want there to be a, a feeling of enthusiasm as we start. So that's basically what I wanted to share, except that in the middle of October, not very, now, not very far from now, we are going to be launching our 40-day church activity, and it's going to be on this book, this new book, What on Earth Am I Here For? And it's a new version, a variation of this book that might be familiar to you, The Purpose Driven Life. I told you last week that I was going to ask Linda to find it for me. Guess what? She did. This is my original copy that I first read January 1st, 2004, and I tried this color coding thing when I underlined. I've been through this baby seven times, this book here. I've got different colors for each time through to the point if you look at my pages, there's practically nothing left not underlined or highlighted. But I have gotten so much out of this purpose, discovering my purpose, that I've done it seven times. So some of you might want to say, well, I already did that. You know, you really expect us to do that in our group again? Guess what? I've been through it seven times. I am looking forward to the eighth time. I hope that you'll join me and plan to participate. In fact, I have one more uh, thing that I'd like to recruit, and that is right here and now on the spot, I'd like you to be praying about you not only participating, but being a host for one of our groups. This is the time that we make it very easy and encourage you to be a host. Uh, in fact, we have a a little acronym. Does that surprise you that we have an acronym for the word host? Would you read it with me? H stands for have a friendly heart. O stands open your home. S, serve something. Something to drink if you want to bring out some pretzels or chips or whatever, that's okay. And T, turn on the DVD. Back in 2004, we had a different saying talking about being host. You can be a star if you can run a, D, run a VCR. VCRs are no longer, I don't know, do they have them still in Cuba today? <laughs> if you're gonna go to Cuba, you could run a VCR, but here you gotta do a DVD. But the standards to be a host 
is be open and share with others. So maybe individually or you could pair up with somebody else. I'd like to challenge you. I'm, I am hoping and challenging you to have 25 hosts, 25 growth groups at our campuses this fall. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? Uh, that would pass the original 40 days of purpose when I think we had 22, if I remember correctly. So that's our challenge. We want to put that out before you. And as I wrap things up, I can't help but I'm not going to sing because I would drive you right away and break all the equipment. But a, a song that I love that's been part of us for many years, I, the song is Find Us Faithful. I'm only going to read a few lines. After all, our hopes and dreams have come and gone, and our children sift through all we've left behind. May the clues that they discover and the memories they uncover become the light that leads them to the road we each must find. May all who come behind us find us faithful. I don't know if you noticed that while Willie was talking, I changed shirts, or I actually took off the outer layer. And this is a shirt. Uh, it's hard for me to pass up something free. My birthday came uh, last year, and Olympia Sporting Goods offered a free shirt. So I went and I got this. And it was a Buffalo Bill shirt. And some of you are just going like this. You don't want me to. You're, maybe you were Bills fans before the first two games. I don't know. It's, it's getting harder to do that. So I bought the shirt mostly because number 14 is Sammy Watkins. He's one of my favorite players on the Bills right now. I didn't even think about this. You remember what, what somebody pointed out to me? We were at a gathering of church leaders, and they said, Bill, do you realize what's on your back? And I got to do this. So that, that was one of the first signs that maybe God wanted us to go to Watkins, you know? We've had a, so many more supportive things since then. Um, last fall, less than a year ago, I was, Linda and I were away in the evening and coming home on a Sunday night, and I was exhausted. She's driving, and she's listening to Family Life Radio, and the song Oceans was playing. Uh, the, I won't read all the words. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown where feet may fail. There I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand. So I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours and you are mine. So that song woke me up as I'm sleeping, and I open my eyes, and guess where we are? We're going down Route 14 into Watkins. You know, so this has been my personal theme song for this Watkins thing. Just like four years ago, it was, if you say go, I will go. Now it's, my, even though I, my feet are going to fail by themselves, with God's blessing, we're going to take on this new adventure. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for Willie's testimony and the story about how that woman, whose name I don't remember, 1938, went to Cuba and led Margarita to the Lord. And look how much has happened because of that. Help us to serve your purpose in our generation. And we trust you, God, to take our gift of service and use it for your plan and your purpose, whether it's in Watkins Glen or one of our other campuses. We give it all to you in Jesus' name. Amen.